Well, my name's uh, Pastor Jason. I'm the uh, kids pastor here at Heart of the City Church. And uh, I get to bring you the word today. And we're in a series called You Asked For It. And if you're new to the heart, uh, on Easter weekend, we give everybody a card and they fill it out of what they want to hear from the stage. And uh, today I'm here to preach on relationship, which was the most asked topic from you guys. Now, the series you asked for it, I, I've heard that many times in my life. My, my mom sitting in the front row when I was a kid and I'd be playing in my room and I'd be on the top bunk and we were playing uh, with my little brother. And I was about to jump off the top bunk and pile drive him. And my mom who would be down the hall in the kitchen cooking, somehow she knew what was going on. She'd say, Jason DeBrock Lowry. Yeah, my middle name's DeBrock. I, I, <laughs> You can ask her about it. <laughs> Jason DeBrock, Lowry, you are asking for it. <laughs> or I think about the time when I finally got enough courage to ask who's now my wife on a date. And she was like, you're asking for this? You better have a relationship with him and you better put a ring on this or you ain't asking for this. I remember when I joined Heart of the City Church many years ago, and it was, it was 2020, so we were online, and I was watching from Boise, and Pastor J.O. brought a message, and I was like, oh, I'm so excited, and he touched my heart, and he throat punched me <laughs> 430 miles away through a screen. <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> By the way, if you missed Pastor J.O.'s message last week on the Holy Spirit, you got to jump online. You got to check it out. It is our DNA. So let's go and get this ready here. And let's see what's going on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can do it. All right. So I titled this series Relationship God's Way. Because let's be honest, it's the only way, right? You see, and, and if we want relationship God's way, what we have to do is we have to start from the beginning. You see, in Genesis chapter one, we get to watch the world get created. And after it gets created, we get to see that it's good. And God made light and he said it was good. And he made you and I in his likeness. He said it was good and plants and trees and it was good. And it got me thinking, when did God say, uh-oh, not good? <laughs> well, let's find out. I'm going to be reading out of Genesis 2 today. And if everybody that's able, please stand for the reading of God's word. It'll be in your Bible app. It'll be on the screen. I'm going to start chapter 2, verses 15 through 23. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then... The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heaven and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Whew, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your word. We come to you today humble, 
and weak, but your word is so sweet and refreshing and strengthening. And Lord, we need your word. May your word fall upon the needs of every person in this house today, Lord, the needs of anybody that's joining us online. Let it go out. And Lord, I thank you for the assignment, that burden that you put on my heart today about relationships done your way. So as we enter this time with full thanksgiving and praise, we say in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. you may be seated. So relationships today are being defined by social media, by Hollywood, by YouTube, instead of the word of God. See, people aren't looking to the church, they're not looking to Christians, and most importantly, they're not looking to the Bible for relationship. And that's the problem. And I guess here's the question is, are our relationships worth looking at? Because see, God gives us wisdom and he gives us knowledge and he wants to reveal to us today the biblical model for relationships. And I believe today he wants to deliver, he wants to reveal, he wants to restore relationships today in this house. Because the truth is, is that God wants healthy relationships. He wants healthy dating relationships even and marriages, and parents, and people that are in singleness. He wants them to have healthy, biblical, guided relationships. And then we get hurt. <laughs> we get damaged. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're blinded by what culture says about relationship. And then we lose sight of what God wants in our relationships. And see, many of us are products of, of hurt and people trying to have a relationship without God's design and, and without his clarity. So we turn to that YouTube expert or we turn to that blogger or we turn to the psychologist on TikTok or whatever it's called. <laughs> and now all of a sudden... We, we look right here, maybe a little bit in the Bible, and now we've reduced God's word. Do not reduce God's word to just another voice at the table. Relationship starts with him, the unwavering, unchanging word of God. And like I stated before, I believe God wants to reveal and he wants to change and he wants to deliver and he wants to heal relationships today. Can I get an amen? amen. And this is why we start at the beginning. Genesis 2 verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Men, let's be honest, we're pretty stupid when we're alone. <laughs> okay? I'm gonna give you an example. My buddy Scott and I, okay, we all go camping and, and one morning really early he gets up to start the campfire. And when he's all by himself and it's wet and it's cold outside, he thinks it's a good idea to pour gasoline on the fire. And then when he's all alone, he's holding the gas can that's now on fire. And all by himself, he throws it into the river because that's a good idea. And as it's floating down the river, one tree and the next tree are all going up in flames. And Scott finally realizes, oh, it's not good to be alone. And he calls out, hey guys, I'm gonna need a little help here. And some of you are thinking, but Jason, I come to church and all the people and they're talking to me and now you give me a card and you want me to go talk to my neighbor about it and after this, I gotta go to Costco and there's gonna be 8,000 people there. Can I just go home and have DoorDash deliver my lunch and have Instacart deliver my groceries and Amazon deliver my packages and I get to be all alone, but God created us for relationship. See, and I hear all, hear all the extroverts, they're like, amen. And all the introverts are like, who let this guy preach? <laughs> yeah. 
But when we're alone and we're isolated and the enemy comes in, and he starts to speak the only language he knows, the language of lies. Wow. Wow. And then we start to believe his word over God's word. And then we start to forget the purpose and the plan that God has for your life. And then we look in the Bible and it says in Ecclesiastes, you've heard verse nine, two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. But what about verse 10? For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. God wants relationship for you. And he wants to heal and restore and deliver that last dating relationship that ended in heartbreak, the marriage that's struggling, the hole in your heart from divorce, a business partner that left you high and dry, singleness and struggling and loneliness or being lost. He wants to heal all of that today because God is a redeemer and he comes today to say whatever's broken, whatever's hurting, as Pastor J.O. would say, whatever's jacked up. Yes. If you trust in me, if you put your hope in me, I will turn it to good. Yes. You see, Joseph said this to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God wants to take bitterness and resentment, and he wants to turn it for your good. And I believe God laid it out right here today in our scripture in Genesis chapter two. I believe he laid out six steps for us. And it starts right here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. The garden, wow, wow. The perfect environment, no sin. It's where we get the word guard, it's guarded. <laughs> the garden is our relationship with God. He wants to be in relationship with each one of you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants you in his presence. You see, that's number one. Number one is the presence of God. That's the first thing we must have to build relationship God's way. We must be in his presence. And if we want to build relationship with anybody else, we must first be in relationship with the Father. We must have intimacy with him in prayer, in worship, time in our secret place, time with him. That's our first step to every other relationship. It's the foundational step is his presence. Because look what happens next, my friends. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. He placed Adam in the garden. He put him there in his presence that's where we want to be. That's actually where we long to be. We long to be back in God's presence. That's why the worship is so powerful in this house. It's our place. And look at this. <laughs> when he puts us in the place, he provides purpose. The Lord God said, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The word work it is also used for worship. <laughs> it's used for service. Keep it, to guard it, to preserve it, to maintain it. God wants to reveal his purpose to you. He wants to reveal his purpose to me. He actually places his purpose right inside her, our hearts and he asks us to work it and he asks us to keep it and if you're married and you're in this room, he wants you to work the marriage. He wants you to keep it. He wants to maintain it. If you're a parent and you're in this room, he wants you to keep it and he wants you to make it work. And guess what? He doesn't make you do it alone because number four is provision. 
<laughs> and God provides provision for the purpose he has for us. I'm going to go to Genesis 2, verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for good for food. God provides provision. He supplies where you're called. And sometimes we don't feel it. And sometimes we don't see it, but he is there. He's going to provide the growth. He's going to provide the provision. And he says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Jason, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Amen. Yes, he will. Provision. Amen. God causes the growth. And if we're not seeing the growth, it might be time to check number one and get back in his presence. Okay. And it might be time to make sure we're in the right place, his presence. And we might want to seek him because he wants to fulfill the purpose that he placed inside you, because God provides provision and growth wherever he is. Number five is the person, identity. You see, God created Adam. He forms him out of dust. He forms him in his own image and his own likeness. When I was in my secret place, I was praying about this message, and I got to this part. God gave me this picture. God was on his knees in the mud, and he was personally making mankind with his own hands. It was beautiful, and the creator God, he made you, and he made you, he made every one of you, and he made me. And in Psalm 139, 13, it says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And there's so much more to that verse. Listen to this. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life is living inside of you. God breathed life directly inside to your body, and now he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. My friends, if God formed us in his image, in his likeness, is it not the right response to only believe what he has to say about you and about me? Because you're not defined by what social media says. You're not defined by what, by what someone else says about you. You are not defined by the damaged relationship of the past or the relationship that maybe is damaged right now. You are defined by him. And I'm about to get real with everybody in this room. In the sixth grade... I was sexually molested by the counselor at my school. The one I was supposed to trust. It would impact my relationships for many years to come. Silence, shame, and guilt. be a secret that I would keep for many, many years. But God, yeah. as I was angry with God and I was angry with myself and I was angry at the world, God showed me that there was another way. And God came in and he healed me and he brought forgiveness and he removed that bitterness and he removed that resentment from my life. Because the number one strategy of the enemy is to come in and try to steal our identity. Yes. But he's a liar. And he's a counterfeit. Yes, he is. And starting today, we only believe what the creator God has to say about you and about me. Yes. And you are chosen. Yes. 
and you are loved, and you are protected. And that's number six, protection. Genesis 2, 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God's commands are not about restriction. They are about protection. They are there to make our lives more fruitful and more meaningful. And when we follow its protection, whew, we have healthy relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves. Imagine Adam, he's posting his reel on social media, and he's like, hashtag, eat freely of every tree except one. And people jump on, imagine the comments. Oh, God's not going to tell me what I can eat. He's going to be like, oh, the loving God telling me I can't eat of the tree. And Adam jumps on, he's like, dudes, I said, every tree except one and he shares the truth and he gets canceled <laughs> when we don't accept protection when we don't learn the goodness that God has for you and has for me we set our own standard our own rules and now I've got no standard no rules and I'm with Somebody else that has no standard or rules and take a look at the world. Wow. Wow. Yet when we're consistent at standards and we're consistent at setting rules, we see the fruit. I'm going to give you an example. My granddaughter, Nova, she's two years old and she, helps, she likes to help me make grandma coffee in the morning and grandma needs her coffee. <laughs> <laughs> And here we are making coffee, and she's two, and she says, careful, Grandpa, it's very hot. <laughs> you see? She's now showing me the protection that's put in place to keep me safe. And parents, I need to talk to you for a minute because... I get to spend week in and week out back there in Heart Kids, and I just want to encourage you, and I want to thank you for the work that you're doing I see your kids. You see, we open up service back there with prayer, and I don't pray, the kids do. I want to share some of the prayers. They're praying for you. Here are the prayers from last weekend, okay? Here they are. Lord, help my dad find a job. God, take away the cancer from my grandma. Lord, I pray for my baby sister who has to have surgery. God, please heal my mom's heart. Those are just a few of the prayers when we open up. So it shows me what you're doing. So I say thank you, parents. You see, presence and place and purpose and provision and person and protection, God provided all of these things to Adam before he met Eve. Because the truth is, is there is only one person that can provide these things, and he is our creator, God. And can I speak to the single people in this room right now? God has you exactly in the place that you're supposed to be in this season right now. He wants you in his presence. He has a place for you. He has a purpose for you. He has your person, your identity for you. He wants to protect you. Right now, before you meet the person. Because when we define relationships by our own place and our own person and we're trying to get from here to there and we're focused on who God has for us before what God has for us, we have it in the wrong biblical order. But when we put it in alignment, oh, it's a beautiful alignment and now we get to see what happens in Genesis 2, 21 and 22. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. For Adam, there was no suitable helper found. So God said, I will make him. A helper. 
See, the word helper is normally used of God. And I desperately need her. And I need her by my side. And I love her. And we are yoked together. You see, why this side? God, why the side? Why the rib? I love what Matthew Henry stated. She isn't made out of his head to top him. She isn't made out of his feet to be trampled by him. She is made out of his side to be close to him, to be protected under his arm. You see, when she's under my arm, She's by my rib, which is next to my heart. And that's exactly where I need her. I desperately need this woman in my life. And I need her by my side. She is my helper. You see, God puts people in your life to help you. And to help you grow closer to him. Yet, (laughs) things get in the way. We allow offenses to impact our relationships. We allow offenses to come in. Maybe it's an offense of resentment. Maybe it was abuse. Maybe it was something little. I don't know what it was, but here come the offenses. And we're allowing them to come in. And they're building in front of us and they're building and here they are. You remember when whoever you're married to and you were dating them and everything they did was just so cute. (laughs) And now pretty much everything they do is just so annoying. (laughs) See, when I met my wife, we knew that we were gonna stay pure before marriage and we knew it was gonna be a challenge. And as a result, we always stayed outside. When your wife is that beautiful, you just don't go inside. It's not safe. (laughs) So we would go for walks and we would go for hikes and we would go for bike rides. And then we get married and we go for our first walk. And if you don't know me, I have a lot of energy. I walk pretty fast and she's like, she's like, can you please slow down? All right, you guys know my wife. She didn't say it like that. She was like, honey, could you please slow down? Right? But that is how I heard it. See, I'm not cute anymore. (laughs) Energy, not cute. Now, I used a marriage example, but I'm not talking about marriages. Offenses come into relationships, all relationships. And it's not a matter if if they're going to come. It's when they're going to come. But more importantly, what are you going to do about it when they come? Unmet expectations are the breeding ground for offenses. But unexpressed expectations are the breeding ground for unmet expectations. It's time to learn to communicate It's time to learn to talk too much. I'm probably talking to mostly men right now (laughs) because we have a hard time expressing our feelings. But it's time to start communicating from a kingdom perspective. I'm going to paraphrase James 1.19 says, listen to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. And Colossians 4.6 reminds us to respond with grace. And I'm not saying easy. It isn't going to be easy because one of you is a saver and one of you is a spender. And the spender just came home with a bunch of uh, bags on her arms or on their arms, their arms, on their arms, on their arms. And, and the saver's like, the saver's like, oh, huh, we're going to pay rent? <laughs> and the spender's like, oh, don't worry about it. I, I saved $137 at Kohl's. <laughs> and the saver's like, how much money do you have to spend to save $137 at Kohl's? And you're trying to remember to respond with grace and slow to anger and speak the truth 
in love. <laughs> There's a million different offenses. And we're not going to respond right. And offenses are going to come. Sometimes it's something small. And then it turns into something big. And now you're behind the wall and you're in prison. And it's what God put together. Let man, no man separate. And you're holding on to it. And then you realize you're the only one in prison because the resentment and the anger that I'm holding on to, I'm the only one that knows about it. But God, God gave us another way. See, if only we had an example of somebody that had every right to be offended. If only we had an example of somebody that could stand at a distance. But he didn't. He actually said, forgive them. And he stretched his arms out wide for love. And he gave us a way to the Father. And he let it all go. And he said, leave it at the cross. And I don't know about you, but now we have to go, now what? If he let it all go for us and he's inviting us to do the same, anger, let go. And bitterness, be gone in the name of Jesus and seek his presence and you can let it go and be in the place that he's called you to be in and let it go. Because the world needs something to look at. And heart of the city church and this building and the relationships here, let's make them worth looking at. Can I get an amen?